All right. Hi, guys. Those of you who are signed in already, um, if you can hear me okay, just go ahead and type in the chat. Let me know. Perfect. Thank you, Donna. Got some more people coming in. So we'll start the presentation in just a minute. Um, but while we're doing that, uh, anybody who wants to type in the chat, just let me know if you are here because you are a gymnast, a parent, a coach, uh, gym owner, a medical provider, anything like that. Um, if you want to just kind of type in and let me know that, go ahead. All right, thanks, Donna. And let's All right, so I'm going to get started here. Uh, I might have to pause a few times to let some people in as everybody gets in. Um, but I don't want to take up too much of your time today. So while I'm talking, if you guys have any questions that you're thinking of, uh, you can either just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask, or you can type in the chat and then I will get to it. Um, all I ask is that as we're going through the presentation that you keep the questions relevant to what we're talking about. And um, if you have any general questions that you just hold on to them until the end, we'll have plenty of time to ask them. But just so we kind of keep things relevant as I'm moving through. Uh, so what I'm gonna do today, we'll, we'll get started here. We're gonna talk about back pain in gymnastics. Um, so just a quick disclaimer, this is meant to be general advice. Uh, obviously I do not know each of you uh, or your kids, your gymnasts that you're uh, working with or that you're the parents of. So do not take everything I say as 100% applicable to your child or the gymnast you work with. Please make sure to seek medical attention if you need it. Um, you can always speak with me privately if you have specific questions. So who am I? Some of you know, some of you might have been to some of these presentations before on different topics. Uh, some of you might not. So my name is Sarah Winferuza. I'm a physical therapist and a certified strength and conditioning coach, as well as a specialist in fitness nutrition. Uh, so what I do, I help athletes that are injured. I do specialize in the care of gymnasts, but I do, uh, I do really enjoy helping gymnasts not to get injured in the first place. So when we can identify some improper movement patterns, some problems early on and correct them before they ever lead to pain, uh, that's what I like to do best because that means that the girls and boys don't have to miss any time from the gym. They can keep doing what we love and we can keep them healthy for a long time. So I own a clinic called Perfect 10 Physical Therapy in Fairfield, New Jersey, uh, inside Tumble Text Gymnastics. Um, I was a former gymnast, and part of the reason why this presentation is special to me is I did have a back injury as a gymnast. I was diagnosed with a spondylolisthesis, uh, which we'll go over in a minute what that means. Um, I did deal with quite a few years of back pain post gymnastics, and now I'm completely pain-free. So we'll talk a little bit about how I was able to solve that pain for myself and how I wish I had the knowledge to do that uh, right when it happened. I don't think I would have had to deal with those years of pain if I knew what to do or had somebody who knew what to tell me to do. Um, okay. So for today's agenda, I am first gonna go through some facts. So all of you might come from different backgrounds. Some of you, if you have a gymnast that's been dealing with back pain, you might know all these anatomy terms better than I do, better than the textbooks do. Um, but I do wanna go through some of that just as we move forward. Uh, I know some of those terms can be pretty confusing. 
Um, and then I'm going to go through some of my opinions on things. Treating the back is not a It's not like when you take your car to the mechanic or for the inspection and they plug in that little machine and then it tells them what's wrong with the car, what needs to be done. It's pretty cool if our bodies could do that, but they can't. So a lot of things in different uh, treatment techniques are based on opinions. So I will give you my opinion on those things. I'm happy to discuss them a little bit further. Um, and I'll talk about what to do if you or your gymnast is currently experiencing back pain. Uh, so every time you hear when I'm talking about if you have back pain, I'm generally talking about your gymnast. If you as an adult have some pain, we can talk about that too. Uh, but mostly I'm talking about the gymnast, what to do if you had back pain in the past, you feel better now and you want to continue feeling better. Uh, then I'm going to talk about ways that I can help uh, potentially. Um, then I had a few people who have previously asked me, messaged me, or emailed me with some questions or some of their own personal cases. Uh, so I'll talk about those a little bit, and then we'll take some time for new questions. So uh, a few facts first, which uh, this figure I found out about, I was writing a paper on back pain and gymnasts a few years ago, and I was really surprised to see this number. 65 to 85% of high level gymnasts, level nine and above, will experience low back pain. So out of 10, that's about seven to nine gymnasts. Out of 10 gymnasts that are level nine and above will experience low back pain. Uh, the only studies I found are done on higher level gymnasts, so I'm not sure what that looks like in the lower levels, but we can imagine it could be pretty similar. Um, in gymnastics, compression forces can be up to 16 times body weight, so that's quite a bit. Uh, traction forces can be up to 10 times body weight. And back strains or back pain is the third most common for reason for missing gymnastics practice or competition, so it's pretty important. Um, so what does the research say? So there's a study done on uh, seemingly healthy gymnasts. So gymnasts who had no complaints of back pain currently or in the past, 11% of them had bilateral pars defects. So we'll go over exactly what that means in a minute. But if some of you are dealing, like I said, you have back pain or your kids have back pain, you probably already know what that is. 6% and these are asymptomatic gymnasts had a grade on spotty lotus defects. And of those, only 54% uh, of them had back pain. So one thing that's important to note is there's a high prevalence of what we call radio radiologic abnormalities. So when you have an x-ray, you have an MRI, and they find something that's abnormal. They find a problem. Um, and it's hard to say now, do these problems, are they necessarily the cause of pain? Because if not everybody with a PARS defect has pain, then maybe that's not the cause of pain. And why do they uh, figure that this is so high in gymnastics compared to other sports? possibly due to those high forces we were talking about. 10 times compression forces, 16 times distraction forces, um, and then the, the extreme positions gymnasts get into. There's not a lot of other sports that do the extreme arching positions of gymnasts. So it might be like those areas are kind of getting worn, um, but it doesn't necessarily correlate with the pain. So uh, in a study of male gymnasts without back pain, 71% had some sort of findings on x-ray or MRI. Um, and then 25% of complaints in gymnasts are related to low back pain. So that's really important topic to be talking about. So I'll talk a little bit about these common diagnoses here. So you guys can probably see in this picture of the spine, if you guys can see that okay. There's a uh, part of the spine called your pars interarticularis, and that's on each vertebrae. So that's kind of this part that sticks out of the spine a little bit, and that's the most commonly. So a spondylolysis is when that site fractures through, and then a spondylolisthesis is when one vertebrae actually slides a little bit on the other vertebrae, and then there's some different grades of that. Um, but if you, like I said, if you're dealing with back pain, these are probably some terms, probably some diagnoses that you might have heard thrown around. So there's a little picture of them. I know it can be hard to see on an actual x-ray sometimes. So we'll talk first about the spondylolysis. So that's uh, that full fracture of the lumbar spine that's typically going to be at the pars, that part of the vertebrae that sticks out. But there are some other places that can fracture. 
um, and still be consider considered a spondylolysis. So it's likely re related to the stress. So from hyper, from consistently extending the spine, those areas are pretty thin when they attach to the spine and then they can just eventually fracture. There are a small set, set of people that have a congenital spondylolysis. So they had it from birth um, and they're gonna have it their whole lives. Um, even people who have it from mechanical stress, from that hyperextension, it might never heal. That area of the spine has very poor blood flow. And we know that we need blood flow to bring nutrients to have bones to heal. And that area, uh, it, it might not happen. It might not heal. But the question then is, does it matter? So I had this bilateral pars fracture, uh, completely fractured through on both sides. I had pain at the time. Uh, I was told due to the positioning of mine, it will not heal. There's no blood flow to that area. And now I'm pain free. So the question is, is it actually the pars, it is, a, is it actually that fracture that causes pain or is it the forces that are pushing and pulling on that fracture that cause the pain? And if we can control those forces, we can be pain free despite having a continued fracture. So this type of fracture is best diagnosed on a SPECT scan or a CT scan. So a SPECT scan, if you have a negative SPECT scan for a fracture, you most likely do not have a fracture. Um, and if you do have a positive fracture on a CT scan, you most likely do have a fracture. Again, imaging, we'd like to say it's 100%, but that's just not the case, unfortunately. Um, so different studies have shown that an MRI sometimes cannot diagnose these fractures as well as a SPECT scan or a CT scan. So this is kind of, um, I'm a really visual person, so I wanted to share with you guys this flow chart. And this kind of will show what happens if you, your gymnast has some back pain and you're concerned about a pars fracture, a pars defect, or a spondy, something like that. Most likely the, the first step is gonna be an x-ray, just like any injury, whether you're at your private orthopedist, at the hospital, anything like that is gonna be a plain x-ray. So if that x-ray is positive, it's probably not a pars fracture. Um, it's probably positive for something else. The, these are very difficult to see on a traditional x-ray. So then you'll have an appropriate workup for whatever that diagnosis is. If it's negative on that x-ray, the best next thing to get is a SPECT scan. Like I said, if that SPECT scan is negative, it's likely not a fracture there. If it is positive, the next thing would be to get a CT scan. If that's negative, then you might have a stress reaction versus a stress fracture. Um, and with a stress reaction, there is better prognosis of bony healing. If that CT scan is positive, then they'll look at the stage of it and you'll have some appropriate therapy to reduce the forces on that fracture because um, it might not heal, like I said earlier. The spondylolus thesis, that's when one vertebrae actually slides on the other, and that can happen because of a disc injury, or if you fracture both sides of that pars, it can slide forward. This is very unlikely, so people get really worried if they have a pars lesion that it's going to slide like this. That occurs in less than 5% of people with bilateral lesions. Um, however, it does happen. Um, a little bit more if on your first time when you have back pain, your first time when you have imaging, you have some slipping already and you have not hit puberty yet, then we need to be a little bit more concerned about that slipping continue. But if you've hit puberty or on your first complaint of back pain, you have no slipping, something that we don't need to be quite as concerned about. I wanna talk a little bit about Schuerbin's disease. So this is gonna be kyphosis rounding of the spine. This is really common in gymnasts also. Um, it's gonna be diagnosed, this can be diagnosed on an X-ray and it's usually treated with rest and activity modification. So throughout this, uh, this webinar, when I talk about activity modification, I'm typically gonna be talking about- Did you have money to pay her? Some of the- um, How much was it? Skills that you would do in the gym. One second. You doing okay? Just gonna mute Why everybody. So big words. Mm -mm. 
All right, then we can talk about disc injuries. So there is a high prevalence of disc injuries due to that repetitive loading. So all those compressive forces. The disc, a lot of people describe it like the jelly inside a jelly donut. And if we squish that donut, we squish that spine down with all the compressive forces, that jelly can come out sometimes. However, in gymnasts, in young people, as opposed to in older, more mature people, there are excellent treatment outcomes. So if somebody does have a disc injury, it typically can be treated and they can go back to being completely pain free. And their first symptoms might be they're unable to really bend forward to perform a pike stretch. They can sometimes have some leg pain. And then this is often treated with activity modification, PT and rest. So modifying some of what they're doing in the gym. So then we can talk about some other causes for back pain. So scoliosis is one. Uh, we can talk about psychosocial causes for back pain. Um, so I believe that all pain does have a little bit of a psychosocial component. If we didn't have a brain, we wouldn't feel any pain. So talking about how our brain processes that pain. So if I'm saying, oh, you know, your, your brain is causing your pain, I'm not saying everything's fine and you're making it up. It's just that for some reason, your brain might be sensing that pain with a larger signal than it normally should. Uh, visceral organs, kidneys, things like that, that's not really something I deal with. If somebody's having back pain and associated with that, some bathroom problems, some pain when they're using the bathroom, pain after they ate a big meal in their back, um, that's something to go see your primary care doctor about. Uh, rib deformities. So a lot of kids that get into gymnastics get into it because they're very, very flexible. And with that can sometimes come something called slipping rib syndrome, where one of their ribs, one or more of their ribs actually slip out of place at times. And that can cause back pain. Um, also some systemic and autoimmune conditions can cause back pain or other congenital factors. So that's things that are genetic. Um, so usually, you know, most back pain, that's what I deal with, that's uh, orthopedic type back pain, kind of has a typical pattern to it where it feels better uh, when they're not doing as much activity. That might not mean complete rest, it might hurt more with complete rest, but that as they do more in the gym, their back hurts more when they back off, it feels better. Um, if it feels the same all the time, it doesn't change, it doesn't change when they sleep doesn't change when they uh, work out or not work out or anything like that. That's something that's a little cause for concern. Might need to get some blood work, see your primary doctor, get it worked up a little bit. Uh, so that's all the facts, that's all the boring stuff. Now we'll talk about probably what you guys wanna hear is a little bit more about the treatment um, and why I think certain things work and certain things don't work. So regardless of the diagnosis, whatever those things that they have, a fracture, not a fracture, a disc injury, what I see a lot in gymnastics is something called lower cross syndrome. And as you guys look at this picture, um, you can probably, a lot of you will think, yeah, that kind of looks like my kids. That kind of looks like my daughter, the kids I coach. And what happens is we have four different problems that all feed into each other. So their lower back muscles, due to all the arching they do, get very, very tight. And they develop a little bit of an extra arch in their back. Their hip flexors get very, very, very tight, and that continues to pull their pelvis forward, and they have this little arch in their back. Then their abdominal muscles are inhibited, and before you guys are like, well, no, not my kids have a six-pack, we'll talk a little bit about why that, this is something different. But there, some of their abdominal muscles can become inhibited, and some of their glute muscles, their butt muscles, can become a little bit inhibited. But a lot of it has to do with all that arching, makes their lower back muscles super tight and then their hip flexors super tight and it kind of leads to some poor movement patterns. So when I say inhibited abdominals that does not mean weak abs. It can mean limitations in a certain plane. So most gymnasts have great six-pack abs. They can do v-ups, hollow rocks, hollow body holds, everything like that for days, for all day. But working on their side-to-side -side abdominal strength as well as on their um, twisting abdominal strength is very, very important. It can also mean limitations in motor control. So the ability to have strength in the muscle is one thing. The ability to turn that muscle on and off with the appropriate intensity at the appropriate time is a whole other thing. 
And then lastly, their ability to create or counter the movements that they're supposed to. So in gymnastics, we do a lot of arching. We do back handsprings, front handsprings, even back layouts and front layouts do have a small amount of arching in them. So the ability of the abs to control and limit that arching motion are so important. And what I see a lot with gymnasts is they're not able to do that. So they're able to create a hollow or flexion movement with their abs, but they're not able to control the arching. Then those vertebrae, the pars, kind of bang on each other and essentially could create a bone bruise, which can eventually lead to a stress reaction and then a fracture or a pars defect. Um, so that's something that's really important to work on is thinking about how you want their abs, how you want their muscles to work while they're doing their gymnastic skills and make sure that your conditioning kind of mimics that. So one thing, you know, with gymnasts, but also even with our everyday people, everybody used to do crunches and sit-ups to get their strong abs, to keep their core strong. But then when we think about it during our day, we're not usually rounding our back and bringing our chest to our legs so aggressively that it doesn't really translate. So we want to think about what will translate from their gymnastics and make our conditioning look like that. Um, so the other thing that's related to this, all the joints in our body have a job. So some of them are supposed to be more stable and some are supposed to be more flexible. They all do both things, but just some more so than the others. So as we go through this, it'll kind of make sense. Like our ankles and our hips, they kind of move in all different directions pretty well, where our knees really just bend and straighten. So they need to be more stable. So that hip needs to be more mobile and that lower back needs to be more stable then the upper back needs to be more mobile. So those three are what I'm really gonna focus on here. And in gymnasts, sometimes their hip, whenever they move, their hip does whatever their lower back does, unlike in other sports. So I just pulled up a few pictures of other athletes here. And you can see for the most part, all these guys, their spine is pretty straight and stable and their hips are flexed. And what they do is use that hip flexion power, use their glutes to extend their body into whatever position they have next or rotate in the case of the golfer. Um, same thing, if you look at somebody doing a heavy deadlift, they're gonna keep that spine stable and use their hips to make that motion. But then when we look at a, gym, a gymnast, they're flexed in the hips and their spine is also flexed. And that leads to a lot of extra movement between the vertebrae, meaning more opportunity for things to kind of bang together, create bruises and fractures, more opportunity for discs um, to move where they're not supposed to. And then same thing when we're talking about arching or extension. So you can see uh, this guy, he's running, but his spine is pretty upright, even though his leg is way behind him. He's extending his hip. Same thing with this other gentleman kicking the soccer ball. His spine is pretty upright, and all that motion is coming from his hip. But then when we look at a gymnast, every time that they arch their, they extend their hips, they also arch their back. So of course, some of that is needed for gymnastics. We can't say never arch your back or you'd never be able to do gymnastics. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what I do think that we need to improve upon is using our ability to extend our hip to the maximum amount and then relying on our spine only for what's needed, what's left rather than a lot of gymnasts who just think my back is flexible, I'm going to use that as much as possible. I think we need to limit that and use it only as much as necessary. So they might still look like they're arching, but if they get a lot of that movement from the hip and then can control that arch, it's going to be a lot better on the structures inside the back. So it's kind of what I had on this slide here. We need to control that arch and maximize the hip extension. So what's important when we're working on this is that uh, if we tell gymnasts, okay, extend your hip, lay on your belly, kick your leg behind you, they're likely going to arch the back. So we have to find some way to round, to neutralize that spine while we extend the hip. And it can be a little bit difficult, um, but I can also give you some ideas for how to work on that because I think that's one of the most important things in stopping uh, what I will call is an epidemic of back pain in gymnasts. If we're saying 65 to 85% of gymnasts have it, I think that's, uh, that's really a problem. So that's one really important thing that we need to focus on. Um, so the next thing is why does rest not help? So I've seen a lot of posts recently on Facebook, uh, kids that were 
had some back pain, they were in the gym, and now either they've been out of the gym and their back doesn't feel any better, or they were out of the gym, they were resting, and now they came back into the gym and they're having a lot of pain. So when we rest, I'm going to come back up to this picture, uh, this upper cross syndrome. So if we imagine that back arched and the pelvis tilted forward, when we relax, that position is almost going to go to an extreme. It's not going to correct itself just based on the balance of our body. It's going to go to an extreme. Our back is going to become even more arched. Our hip flexors are going to become even more tight. And that's going to leave our abs and our glutes not really doing too much. So like I said, I'm a visual person. I like to look at pictures. So imagine these four people and we can say one guy is your uh, abs, one guy is your glutes, one guy is your low back and one guy is your hip flexors. So let's imagine that your lower back muscles are the strongest. If they are all, if these guys are all running in opposite directions and that uh, those lower back muscles are winning and it's dragging the whole group slightly in that direction, if they slow down from a run to a walk, that lower back muscle guy is still gonna be the strongest. He's still gonna pull them in that direction. It's not like everything is just gonna even out because they go from running, which is, equivalent to their fully training gymnastics to walking, which is their equivalent of resting. Um, so sometimes that will not help. A, an active rest period where they're actively working on correcting those imbalances is usually the best if there's not any severe acute fracture, disc issue, anything that really requires um, some time completely off. So I wanna talk real quickly about my story. This isn't about me. This is about what you guys wanna hear. Um, but it, I think it is an important story to share. So I had bilateral pars fractures diagnosed in 2012. That was the first time I had back pain it was in 2012. I was a senior in college, but I was actually told that those fractures were probably between five to 10 years old. What was interesting to me that I didn't understand at the time was that I never really had pain prior to that. So I didn't understand how I could have two fractures in my spine never having pain and now all of a sudden they were so acutely painful that when i had to drive a half hour to the doctor's office i had to stop and get out of the car because of the pain and what really happened was that i had stopped gymnastics i had taken up diving but it was a lot less uh, intensive activity for me so i think my muscle imbalances got a lot worse with that rest so just like this tug of war um, as I started to rest, those strong low back muscles really took over and made the pain worse. After that, uh, that was in my senior year of college, and then I stopped college. I stayed active going to the gym and things like that, but uh, very significantly less than when I was competing in sports in college, and I had significant pain, and I think it's because those muscle imbalances were continuing to get worse as I was continuing to get weaker. Once I addressed those muscle imbalances, after about four years of pain, it took me about six weeks to be completely pain-free. Um, I'd already been a PT. I had gone to the state fair in Texas one time, and after walking around for three hours, I had to lay down on my way back to the car, and I realized I had to fix something. So that's when I really got into studying these types of back issues and learning how to work with them. And once I was able, to, I realized I could really, my glutes were not doing well. I could not really extend my hips. And once I fixed that, like I said, it took me about six weeks to be completely pain-free. Um, was not doing gymnastics anymore, but into weightlifting, CrossFit, things like that. Um, and didn't have any problem once I worked on fixing that. So I'm going to go over a few of the common uh, treatments besides PT and just kind of give you guys my thoughts on them. So injections, uh, what I really think they do is they numb the pain. They do decrease inflammation, but inflammation is part of the healing process. It helps our bodies to heal. Now, in some cases that inflammation can linger and it can hang around too long. And then we may wanna consider doing something to help get rid of it. But for the most part, we want that inflammation to let our bodies know that it needs to heal that area. The other problem with the injections is that they're often delivered at the site of the deformity, but that's usually the strongest team member. And I'm gonna explain a little bit what I think about that because this is something really important to understand. So uh, this is a crew team here, they're all rowing in the boat, but I want you guys to imagine them as different vertebrae. 
So let's say this guy in the middle that I have circled, he is the strongest member on the team and he's rowing the fastest and the hardest. He's carrying the team. Obviously, he's going to get tired first because he's been working the hardest. So now if we take him out of the boat, we numb him, we inject him with something and take him out of the boat, that may not solve the boat's problem of going faster if everybody else does not pick up the pace. Um, then everybody else is going to start to get tired. If the guy next to him starts to pick up the pace, that guy's going to get tired. So injecting at the side of the deformity is not always best. The area that has that problem is not always the weakest area. Usually there's another area that is having a problem that's making that area work harder to solve it. Um, the next thing is fusion surgery. So unfortunately, sometimes I've seen surgeons, doctors jump to fusion surgery in gymnasts. Um, and that really makes me upset because that type of surgery really cannot be reversed. They can take the screws out, but it is a lifetime problem that you have once you've had that surgery. Now, yes, I understand there are some cases where it's necessary. Um, and I have had one or two patients who have had it and it's solved their problem and that's great. Uh, but I think that it's done more than it's needed. And so again, the reason why I just like this surgery, that area that's worn out is not usually the root cause. So usually what happens to this is whatever area is worn out or tired in the spine, they basically fuse it, they screw it, and cage it to the next area of the spine. Um, but usually there's something that caused that area to have to work so hard and get worn out in the first place. Also, especially if you want to return to gymnastics, your spine is still going to want to have a total amount of motion. You're still going to want to try to do a bridge or a back handspring. If it can't get it from that one area that's fused, it's going to get a little bit more motion from each other segment of the spine. And eventually those areas can get worn out too. And unfortunately, I've seen uh, young gymnast teenagers who have had one fusion and within a few years, they have another segment fused and another and another and they never really solve their problem, and they just uh, have a lifetime of back pain after that. So uh, next thing is what about bracing? The evidence is conflicting on whether it will help with back pain. I have seen some positive results. So if you have a confirmed spondy or unconfirmed spondy that doesn't heal without rest, it might be worth a try but only really in the acute phase. So not for gymnastics, just for uh, when you're having a lot of pain, if you're resting out of the gym, maybe going to PT, it might be helpful in some severe cases. Um, but uh, there's a really cool solution that I recently found out about. So the Corleo, it's like a compression brace for the spine that's basically built into a leotard. So it might be a great solution for some kids who feel like the compression is helpful for them while they train. Um, but obviously it's very hard to train in a brace, so wearing the Leo can be super, super helpful. Um, it also improves proprioception, which is basically like your body, your uh, brain's map of your body. So it helps to activate your stabilizing muscles. So similar to how kinesio tape or rock tape work, but it covers more surface area. It covers the whole back. Um, decreased pain receptor activation, so if we're worried about a significant injury, we might not want to hide that pain. But if we know there's not significant pathology, uh, it might be okay to use this to just help give a little bit of support to the back. Um, studies have shown that it improves landing and loading mechanics. Uh, and at the end of this presentation, I'm going to share with you a promotional code that they've shared with me uh, just for you guys, just for people who came to this presentation, um, if you're interested in purchasing one of these. So what about exercises? I think they're great. They just need to be specific and performed correctly. So most gymnasts will default to that pattern of overusing their spinal muscles and their hip flexors and underusing their, some of their deeper abdominal muscles and their glutes. So it's just really important that we work to correct that imbalance if it's present and not just have them aimlessly for, uh, perform exercises where they're gonna reinforce that pattern. Um, that I think is probably the best solution to back pain. It does not, it's not invasive, anything like that, uh, really working on correcting those imbalances. So what about the other stuff? There's a lot of things that play a role in pain, especially nutrition, sleep, hydration, and hormones. 
all those play a large role in both the presence of pain, the perception of pain, likelihood of injury. So they're often overlooked, but they are some of the easiest things to change. And I kind of put that in quotation marks because it's not always easy to change your nutrition or change your hydration, but it is pretty cut and dry. Um, so if you do feel like this is something that you need to work on, I think meeting with a professional that specializes in these topics might be appropriate. Uh, I know also a big problem with a lot of time out of the gym. I, I shouldn't say a problem, but a lot of gymnasts went through puberty during this time. They grew, they had some changes. Um, during our hormonal cycle for females, there's a certain time of the month where our ligaments get a little bit more lax and we might experience generally uh, more bodily pain during that time. So most of us just perceive it as achiness. And if we're older or adults, we kind of deal with it. Maybe we skip our workout a little bit that week. Um, but for these kids that are training during that time, it can play a big role. If they feel okay, they were feeling okay, and now all of a sudden uh, they're about to get their period and their pain is coming back, their ligaments can actually be a little bit more lax. So depending on the person, they might need to modify their training during that time or just remember uh, that they need to be a little bit more cautious. So what to do if you have back pain? Um, if it came on suddenly or after an accident, if it's acute, see a medical doctor, be sure to get imaging and monitor for signs of decreased sensation or motor control. Those are all things that mean I need to go to the hospital now. Um, but other than that, if it's chronic, if it's been on for a while, so things you should do is see a PT or a movement professional, modify activity appropriately. So consider skills that limit arching. If you've had a spondy in the past, you might need to take some walkovers and handsprings out of your routines and do just round off tumbling, uh, consider roundoffs on beam, that tucks on beam, things like that instead. Uh, consider taping our topicals for pain relief. Again, we wanna get through the root cause of the problem, but while that's going on, if you need a little pain relief, some taping, some topicals, possibly that core Leo can be helpful. Um, definitely talk to your coaches, make sure they're aware of the situation and what's going on and get a second opinion. So I kind of promote this for anybody, even patients who come to see me as a PT, if they want to get a second opinion, I fully support that. Um, there's a lot of different professionals with a lot of different techniques that they use, and one technique is not going to work for everybody. Um, so if you're upset, you're unsure about what your doctor or your professional or even your PT told you, get a second opinion. That's never a bad idea. Um, if it is chronic, do not panic. Uh, do not go to the ER unless your pain is very severe. A lot of times they'll just inject you or give you medication. It's probably not going to uh, help too much. Um, do not continue training and hope it will go away. That's not going to be the case, uh, especially for most of us right now. We're kind of just getting back into the gym. We're not going to be competing for a while now. Is certainly not the time to try to push through something because it will be impossible to push through it for six months or so. Um, do not only use passive treatment. I know that massage, uh, cryotherapy, laser, things like that, they can all feel good. And I do believe they all have a place in rehab. But if you only do that, you're not addressing the problem and it's likely going to come back or you're going to feel like you're never getting better. Uh, the other thing not to do is to not harp on the diagnosis. So I talked a little bit earlier about how uh, like 71% of asymptomatic male gymnasts had some of these diagnoses. Uh, but they didn't have pain. So don't get too worried about it. Obviously, know your diagnosis, do your, uh, do your research, but don't get, don't get too worried about it. Worry more about how you feel. Uh, also, do not jump to quitting gymnastics or jump to surgery. Again, I understand there are some situations where these things, unfortunately, might be necessary, but I think there are some doctors out there that hear gymnastics, and they say, oh my goodness, that's so dangerous. You should quit. You should stop where I just really don't believe that's the case. I believe that we just might need to adjust some things uh, to get you to keep being able to keep working out. So what if I've had back pain in the past or I don't wanna have it in the future or I got rid of it and I wanna stay pain free? There's a few different things that you can do. So getting regular checks up, checkups with your PT. Uh, if I had my way, I'd love to see the gymnast one time per month just to kind of check up, make sure that their movement patterns are doing well, that they don't have any major problems, and again, prevent those problems before they happen. Do you continue your PT exercises? So something else that I see a lot is people who either stop PT or they're dismissed from PT early. 
by the time you're finishing your physical therapy, it should be about as strenuous on your body as gymnastics is. Now, obviously, you might not be tumbling in your PT office, um, but you want to make sure that you are getting similar forces on your body to make sure everything really feels good and not just jumping from basic table exercises and then going in the gym and tumbling and saying, I don't know why it hurts. That would be like giving a third grader an eighth grade math test and saying, I don't know why they fell make sure you're covering that whole spectrum. Um, the other thing that I think is great is to find a team to keep you in check. So this is becoming more and more popular. Uh, but I think that having a physical therapist or a chiropractor, a medical doctor, um, and if, if you like massage and modalities, kind of getting your team in order before you ever need them is good. They can keep you in check already. Um, and then if you do get hurt, you already know who you're going to and you don't need to be searching for somebody. Um, so how can I help? Like I said, I, I went through back pain. I had this and I would like to avoid, help other gymnasts avoid having it. So you can reach out to me at uh, info at Perfect 10 PT or on my website. Uh, I do have a Facebook group, Pain Free Perfect 10, uh, where I put some information about webinars like this that I'm doing uh, and other injury prevention information, things like that, uh, some exercises and things. Um, I can help you find professionals in your area. So if you're, if you don't know a PT that specializes in gymnastics, I have a list of about 75 of them uh, throughout the country that's continuing to grow. So if you'd like to work with somebody in your area, I can hopefully help you find somebody. Um, when appropriate, if you need, I can provide some consultations or advice. So best thing is to reach out to me uh, at my email and we can talk about that. Uh, the other thing I'm really excited to share with you guys is I just released a four-week to better back health program. So this is an at-home program, eight, uh, eight workouts, about 15 minutes each, focusing on correcting those most common problems that I see in the gym, um, uh, correcting those most common muscle imbalances that I see. If you have current pain, if you're currently seeing a PT, finish that first. This is more for somebody who has no pain or minimal pain or soreness that does not warrant a doctor's visit, but you just wanna, again, prevent those injuries before they happen or maintain your healthy status after you've recovered from an injury. Um, so if you're interested to that, uh, interested in that, I'll be sending out an email later or tomorrow about it, a little bit more, and it's minimal equipment needed. There's one uh, band you might need to order from Amazon if you don't have a TheraBand at home. Other than that, everything you should uh, have at home that you'll need. Uh, this program is just forty dollars. So that's eight exercises. That's five dollars or eight uh, workouts. Five dollars per workout. Each workout has six or seven exercises. But I am offering a promotion. So the first ten people. Uh, that are interested in this will get both $10 off and will also get a free 20 minute consultation with me. And you'll use the promo code back to gym. So I'll, again, I'll send out an email about that tomorrow. But if you're interested, I am only offering that to 10 people. So jump on it as quickly as possible. All right, I want to take this time to go through a few questions that were already asked of me um, and kind of answer those. And then I'll take questions from anybody else who has them. So somebody asked me, will my child have more pain in the future? And some of these questions were relatively uh, not, not quite specific. They were pretty broad. So I try to give some broad answers to them. If anybody who asked me these questions is on here, feel free to reach out and give me some more details about them. Um, but if the pain is taken care of during their gymnastics career, if they truly get to the root cause of the pain and solve that, they will likely not have more pain in the future. Um, so something important to remember is that back pain is just not something gymnasts have to deal with. So unfortunately, the mentality is still there, even though we're trying to change it where, you know, you're a gymnast, things are going to hurt and soreness, possibly they're training a lot, uh, but back pain, not so much. So making sure that it's really taken care of, not like this is the best it's going to get. Okay. Uh, I would not stop searching, uh, if your child or your gymnast you work with have back pain, do not stop searching for different providers or different methods until they are pain-free. Um, now, again, if they have an acute accident, so something happens, they have a severe fracture, spinal cord injury, those are different stories. But if it's pain that came on progressively, it should go away. 
um, they may need to continue to monitor it as they grow. So if you have a 10 or 11 year old who has these muscle imbalances, they have some back pain, they go to PT, they get, get it taken care of, that's great. When they hit 12 or 13, their bodies grow, they may kind of default back into that pattern. So either following up with your PT or making sure at the first sign of the pain coming back that you do get it taken care of is important. Um, also staying active is important. Like I said, rest will usually, complete rest will usually not solve these problems. Um, so if you do stop gymnastics, making sure that you find something else to keep you active. So uh, next one, somebody found out in March that their daughter had Bertolotti syndrome, which is an extra vertebrae in the lumbar region. She had back pain for about a year. The chiropractor said a herniated disc, so they saw a neurologist who said no herniation, so they saw a PT. The PT said uh, pain in the back due to muscle weakness, told to start say, taking some supplements, and they're very confused. Um, so one thing, again, this is a little bit broader. This is the only information I have. So what I would say, uh, the first thing is that most chiropractors use x-rays as their only imaging, and herniated discs cannot be seen on x-rays. So a lot of uh, doctors who look at x-rays, they'll look at the spacing between the vertebrae to hypothesize if there is a disc problem or not. Um, but because of all the compressive forces in gymnastics, that just may not be true for gymnasts. So they may have decreased space between the vertebrae. That does not always mean there's a herniation. Um, it can also be due to the lack of space from that extra vertebrae. Uh, that extra vertebrae obviously cannot be addressed, so we need to look at what can be addressed. So the muscle imbalances and uh, taking those supplements are things that can be addressed. Uh, I do think that you need to wait the full 60 days before making any decisions, but seeing another provider in any of those specialties, so whether it's a chiro, a doc, or a PT, sometimes a second opinion, if they kind of say the same thing as somebody else, uh, it might give you a little bit more confidence to go in that area. But again, I will say, try not to get too hung up on the diagnosis. Just look at uh, the pain, how the pain is progressing, and if any of these things are improving the pain and go with that. Um, so somebody else asked about a herniated disc in L5S1 that hasn't healed with no months of gym. So again, uh, active problems require active solutions. So I'm just not sure about what treatment has been going on. If it's just rest, we kind of talked about why that might not be helpful. Um, and then I would also kind of need to know for this how that herniated disc was diagnosed and if that's the root cause of the pain or if that is itself more of a symptom. So this is when I need a little bit more information to kind of talk on more. But those are things we talk about. And then this last one, I think I had emailed with this mom a little bit um, other than that, but no obvious injuries on an X-ray or MRI, but highly inflamed following a high speed collision with the vault table. Um, so might need another type of imaging. Like I said, those SPECT scans on CT scans are actually better for uh, double checking about fractures. Um, and then also interested to know what other treatment they had, making sure that nerves and organs are checked. And then uh, why did they occur? Was it truly just a trip, truly just an accident? Or did something happen that actually led up to that tripping and accident? So those are some things that we would need to look at. All right. Um, what other questions do you guys have for me? I'm going to stop the screen share here for a minute. And just go ahead if you do have any other questions or any other topics you want me to touch on, uh, feel free to type it in the chat or just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Can I ask something? Sure. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay. I got My it. name is Tammy. I have a, I have a, uh, almost 13 year old daughter. She's level seven going on eight. Okay. And we've been dealing with back pain for a couple years. We have had just a regular x-ray. They were trying to roll out the spondy or whatever you were talking about. Uh -huh. I can never say it, That's fine. Um, but I'm certainly... hearing from you that that's probably not, that probably wasn't the best. An x-ray probably wouldn't have shown the best way. Yeah. She also did have an MRI, which they said was fine. Okay. Um, and, but she just is dealing with back pain, but something that you said that kind of like stuck with me is, I mean, she's like, I'm at her gym right now. Uh -huh. She feels pain when she's doing gymnastics, but she feels pain all the time. Okay. Like at night when she's in bed, 
she cannot sit through a church, you know, you know, in our congregation yeah. sitting at church, she, I find her taking like ibuprofen before she goes to school. Cause she can't sit through school. She can't sit through all the testing. Mm. I mean, it's just always on her brain and it's always hurting her. So, I mean, is that something that needs to be looked at more? Like you were saying blood work and things like that, or is it really a lot of what you're showing on that diagram, the, uh -huh. whatever that yes. was, I, yeah, I got you. The cross, like the, you know, kind of ab muscles. And I know her, I know her hips are super tight. I wouldn't have believed it because she's super flexible uh -huh. and she can do all her splits and everything like that. But when I've tried different exercises with her to show a range of motion in her hips, she is uh -huh. very unflexible in her hips. Okay. Um, anyway, I guess I'm just trying to understand like, should I keep going the route of this is like a back injury or could there be something else going on? Cause it's all the time. I would say, you know, that all the time is usually a little bit concerning for me. Um, okay. if it's been, you know, years, like you say, I don't think there's anything wrong with kind of going both routes at the same time, if that makes okay. sense. Um, yeah. if you do take our, you know, to the primary and get blood work, it might not be, it might not be something that's, solved in a week, you know, because they might refer you to another specialist or something like that along that line. Um, and what would that be searching after like the blood work? I like, mean, that's a little, like, I'm going to, I'll tell you some things that I'm thinking of, but this is a little bit out of my realm. This is usually when right, I okay. say, you know, I have this network of people go see some of them, right. um, but kind of like a, a chronic inflammation type thing. Um, okay. There's like, I don't, I don't want to scare you by saying something when I don't really know. This is not really my realm. Uh, but no, I know. I, I guess in my head, I'm just thinking, is there something I can even just say to the doctor? Like, are we looking for something else? Yeah. I don't even know what it is. But say like in general, more of like a chronic inflammation um, or like autoimmune type thing, potentially. Okay. Um, okay. But again, like I said, that's not exactly my specialty. Um, so, right. Yeah. But I, I would pursue that route. Has she seen a PT? She has not seen, well, we went to see a PT and kind of, they kind of made a structure and she has had a little ordered the x-ray and was thinking it could have been like the spondy and something like that. So, and then we did go to an orthopedist who uh, did the MRI. Okay. Um, and so then the next route now is that we're out to go to a PT. But the first PT okay. we went to was sort of like, well, we can maybe do some exercises, but it sounds like she's really active. I mean, I kind of was just like, well, then if you can't help her, like she, you know, I don't yeah. know. It wasn't a great experience. <laughs> Yeah, I understand that. I mean, as a PT, just like any other profession, you know, I'm going to say there's good and bad. And then there's also people that specialize in different types of injuries and kind of oh, for sure. differently, um, yeah. just like anything else. And just like, you know, when I was first a PT, I should apologize to everybody I saw in my first month of being a PT. <laughs> because I had a doctorate degree, but I don't, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, right. So finding somebody that's worked with gymnasts before, I think, especially with back injuries, because the demands on a gymnast's back are so different than any other sport, right. um, is kind of important. Uh, and realizing that strength, you know, I'm sure your daughter, she's high level gymnast, uh, is very, very strong. But being right. able to tease out some of these more motor control and compensations with different muscles, things like that, uh, might be important. Okay. Um, so I would say it would be reasonable for you to do both of those things. So to go see that PT and then at the okay. same time, maybe, you know, when, when you have some time, follow up with her primary care doctor and just kind of see if they have any concerns for something that could be more systemic with all okay. that consistent type pain. Right. Yeah. Does that's that our big concern. Question? Yes. That was great. Thank you so much. No problem. No problem. Um, any other questions? Uh, 
All right. So um, I'm going to send out, I had quite a few people register who couldn't make it to the actual session today. So everybody, including you guys, so I didn't have to separate it, is going to get a recording of this. Um, do I recommend taping for pain? So absolutely. Um, again, I think that finding out why there's pain is very, very important uh, rather than just kind of like putting some tape on it. But while you're working to find it out, or even when you do find it out, when you're seeing a PT the, or whoever you're seeing, the pain's not going to be solved in one day. Um, so taping, I think, is great. Uh, rock tape, actually, let me grab it. They make a nice, big, thick tape. I don't know of any other company that makes one. That's four inches wide. I got a black shirt on, so it's four inches wide like that. I think that's my favorite thing to use on the back, uh, either straight across or two strips up each side of the spine there. Um, can be really great just to help to decrease some of that pain. Uh, and I like taping because it helps our brains to improve our muscle recruitment in whatever area is taped. Um, so... Yes, definitely. And if you want any more specifics on that or a diagram of how I do it, uh, just send me an email and I will make sure to get that to you. Um, all right. So if there's no other questions, we will we'll wrap it up there. Uh, like I said, so I've been, I don't know, some of you guys might have seen, uh, seen about this on Facebook or different places. Like I said, my Facebook group, Pain Free Perfect 10, I'm going to be moving to announcing these sessions pretty much exclusively in that group. Uh, so go ahead and join on there if you're interested in some future ones. Uh, I'll do another one the first week in August. Um, if you have any suggestions on topics, feel free to email them to me. If there's no suggestions, I'm thinking about either shoulder pain or knee pain uh, for gymnasts. So just let me know. And then, uh, like I said, that core Leo, the promo code is relief. And if you buy two of their Leos, you can get one free and that's for compression on the lower back. Um, and that is all. So feel free. I'm just going to type my email again in the chat here. That's usually the best way to get in contact with me. If you have any questions or anything specific that you didn't want to share with the group, um, go ahead and type and send me an email and I will get back to you. All right, guys, great. Thank you for joining me today and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and I hope all of you and your daughters and gymnasts that you work with feel better. And one thing I will say, last thing, is uh, if they are having pain, just don't stop looking until they feel better or until you've had 30 people tell you that they're not gonna feel better. I think too many people are content uh, living with back pain and telling others to live with back pain, but I just don't believe that that's necessarily the case. So just keep looking if you need any recommendations for people. I do have uh, somewhat of a network throughout the country, so just reach out and I can try to connect you with somebody. All right, guys, enjoy your Wednesday.